full scale um, studies, um, but nothing on the scale of this one. So I think it'll be really useful to hear Michael's take and to um, and to pick up on the on the key points and the key kind of discussion that comes out of it. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to say no more, but to um, but to hand over to Michael. OK, thank you, Paul, and good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for uh, the invitation. Uh, commendations to you in the Eastern region. You were very quick off the mark uh, in terms of um, uh, blocking out some time where uh, uh, you and I could reflect on um, the findings of the national analysis. So um, uh, well done for that. Um, I've got uh, 29 slides that I'm going to put up in a moment and and run through. Um, I won't be looking at, at the chat box uh, whilst I run through the slides, but um, uh, Paul and I will look at the chat box when when I finished and also we can use the hand function then uh, to um, uh, to have a conversation uh, uh, with each other. If you attended the national launch yesterday, um, uh, some of the slides will be familiar uh, to you, but I have added some additional ones um, and um, and perhaps there's no harm in uh, ploughing the same field more than once, uh, not least because I probably can't remember exactly what I said yesterday, so I may well say things slightly differently uh, or indeed um, uh, input this afternoon things that I didn't have time to say yesterday. Um, so, um, good to be with you. I'm now going to uh, attempt to put my slides uh, up. Um, so, there we go. Okay. Um, uh, Howard or Paul, could you just confirm that, that, um, that the slides are there? Yes, they are indeed. Okay, great. Then um, I will travel hopefully through the slides. So, um, I'm going to present um, some findings from the analysis of safeguarding adult reviews between April 2017 and March 2019. Um, uh, Paul, you are quite right. This is uh, a landmark study uh, in that it is the first ever national analysis of uh, SARS uh, in England. There have been regional analyses, uh, 2017 in London and in the southwest. Uh, and uh, there was also a regional analysis of SARS in the East Midlands that I, from memory, I think was also 2017. Um, but we've not had a national uh, picture uh, before now. Um, so um, this really is um, a, a landmark opportunity for us to reflect on the, uh, the state of adult safeguarding uh, in, in England. It was commissioned by the Care and Health Improvement Programme, uh, which is uh, funded by the Department of Health and Social Care, uh, but uh, the programme is co-produced um, and delivered and indeed overseen by uh, LGA and, uh, and ADAS. Uh, the full report uh, and the executive summary uh, is available on the Local Government Association uh, website. Um, and what I'm going to uh, do today is to present some findings, uh, talk a bit about the priorities that we identified for sector led improvement. That will probably take somewhere around 45 minutes, uh, 50 minutes, and then uh, we've then got about an hour uh, for um, for a conversation for your questions uh, and observations. But I want to start um, uh, with a slide which I didn't use yesterday, uh, although I did talk about um, uh, Terence's uh, message at the end of uh, the launch webinar yesterday. And I've put um, uh, these quotes up because uh, one of the findings from the Safeguarding Adult Reviews uh, in, in the national analysis and indeed one of my findings as a SAR author uh, and indeed as a SAB independent chair in Brent and in Lewisham, is um, uh, how, of, how often we know so little about the individuals uh, that uh, are the focus um, of a safeguarding adult review and how uh, easy it appears to be 
uh, for uh, statutory organisations in particular uh, to forget that they're dealing with a human being. Uh, and in line with making safeguarding personal, in addition, I felt that it was only right that the, the starting point should be messages from um, uh, two individuals uh, who have been the sub uh, who have been um, the subject of uh, safeguarding adult reviews. So a message from Helen um, uh, about her perspective. Uh, this is in a SAR that is in the public domain. Um, it is a SAR um, uh, that focused not just on adult social care and uh, the treatment that uh, Helen received uh, from at least one uh, acute uh, NHS trust, um, but also the inputs uh, from children's social care, um, because uh, Helen as a disabled adult uh, also had a disabled son um, who um, was receiving services uh, from children's social care um, and one of the uh, highlights um, or emphases in the SAR uh, is the importance of thinking family and the importance of uh, adult social care and children's social care uh, collaborating and cooperating uh, together so that the needs of the whole family uh, are met and sadly that did not happen um, in in this particular uh, case, um, despite some effort, particularly from children's social care, uh, to sh to ensure that there was uh, more of a think family approach than ultimately uh, materialised. And the second quote is from Terence, uh, a person um, uh, sl uh, sleeping uh, rough. Um, and and the Worcestershire uh, SAB thematic review uh, on that uh, on that subject actually begins with a quote from Terence, um, and I applaud uh, the SAB for doing so. Um, uh, and so this is what Terence said when he was asked what he needed, and I think it just underscores actually what we know, but all too often perhaps uh, don't find a way of delivering which is that it's relationships that really matter um, and and the sense of humanity and humaneness and carefulness in the hyphenated sense of that word, um, uh, the importance of all of that uh, in the work that we that we do. So for those of you who are uh, business managers, independent SAB chairs, uh, partners on safeguarding adult boards, perhaps uh, the message from both Helen and Terence is how assured uh, are we uh, that uh, services being uh, offered and delivered uh, to individuals are characterised uh, by relationships, uh, by trust, by consistency, by persistence um, and by uh, a, a sense of humaneness and carefulness. So back to the national analysis itself, um, uh, how we went about it and, uh, and what we obtained uh, through that uh, approach. So as uh, some of you this afternoon know, uh, um, we sent a request to all SABs asking for published and unpublished uh, reviews that were completed between April 2017 and March 2019. And as you can see, 129 of the 132 SABs uh, in, uh, in England uh, contributed uh, information. So a 98% uh, response rate. And as a researcher, I have never worked on a project uh, where uh, we have uh, had such a, an excellent response uh, from, uh, uh, as it were, our sample. We triangulated what board sent with uh, what is in the uh, non-functioning National Library, uh, currently uh, held by Sky, and we also searched a number of websites um, uh, to uh, see whether there were any additional uh, reviews. There is one point that, that perhaps I'll make here, 
um, although I could make it in a number of places. And again, it's a message particularly to SAB chairs and SAB business managers. Um, and that is whether uh, your SABs have an accurate uh, chronology or, or history, if you like, of the work that you have done, uh, both post Care Act uh, implementation in relation to SARS, but also pre-CARE Act uh, in relation to um, uh, what were then serious case reviews. Um, and I say that in the context that a number of SABs uh, indicated that either they had never done a review when I knew full well that they had, um, uh, or, or they were only able to give uh, me a partial history um, of of the work uh, that they had done. Um, so perhaps um, a message going forward, business managers change, uh, independent chairs certainly change, um, uh, uh, individuals who represent um, partner agencies uh, come and go, uh, all of that is inevitable. Uh, so where is the history kept um, uh, so that uh, you can revisit it uh, when necessary? As a result of uh, uh, predominantly the contribution from SABs, uh, we obtained 231 uh, SARS, um, uh, and we're pretty confident that that actually does represent uh, the complete picture of reviews that were completed uh, within that two year time window. Uh, and we used a data collection tool, um, which uh, Susie Bray and I had initially developed uh, when looking at uh, SARS relating to self-neglect. And we uh, developed that data collection tool with our colleagues in research in practice. Um, and we will make that data collection tool um, available uh, to SABs um, in early 2021. Uh, so that if you if you choose uh, regionally or sub-regionally or indeed just locally um, uh, to analyze uh, reviews, um, uh, you've got a data collection tool that you can use uh, that will assist you to do that. And that data collection tool enables uh, a quantitative analysis. Um, and if you've read uh, the full report, which is 200 pages um, plus the appendix with the data collection tool, um, uh, you will see um, a, a substantial amount of quantitative analysis uh, alongside uh, a qualitative analysis of what emerges uh, from uh, SARS, all within uh, a thematic framework, uh, which I'll take you through uh, now. And this is the thematic framework. Uh, it comprises five domains, and as you'll see when uh, when I um, move uh, through um, some of the slides, uh, you, you will see um, uh, these five domains. Uh, so in line with making safeguarding personal um, uh, and putting individuals at the uh, centre and heart of what we do, uh, uh, the first domain is uh, direct work with the person and with the person's uh, family and social networks. Um, so direct work is the first domain. There's then the team around the person uh, and how effectively uh, that team uh, worked uh, with the individual and their networks, but also how members of the team around the person uh, worked uh, with each other. And as you know, SARS are often commissioned um, because of concerns about how services worked uh, together. Uh, so that is quite a key uh, domain. The third domain is how well or otherwise uh, organisations um, uh, support their members of the team around the person. Uh, so the focus here on management oversight, uh, supervision, uh, peer support, access to specialist inputs, uh, including from um, uh, legal practitioners um, uh, and, and the kind of culture uh, that individual organisations uh, create. Um, so, for example, uh, do people feel um, that it is safe to escalate concerns, um, uh, for example? So organisations around uh, the team, around the person. 
And then the uh, SAB oversight uh, of all of this, remembering that a key statutory mandate for SABs is to seek assurance about uh, the effectiveness of adult safeguarding uh, procedures uh, in in uh, the SABs uh, locality uh, and where necessary the effectiveness uh, um, of uh, adult safeguarding procedures when people are out of um, authority. And indeed, uh, I chaired a meeting of the London uh, SAB chairs uh, this morning and out of borough placements um, was an issue that we spent uh, some time this morning uh, looking at. So the whole area of SAB governance, provision of training, provision of multi-agency policies and procedures, um, and support for agencies when a SAR is commissioned. And then lastly, the outermost domain, uh, the legal policy and indeed financial context, uh, to highlight that adult safeguarding is situated in a national context. And of course, that is illustrated so clearly um, currently uh, in, in the response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, not least in relation to people who were homeless uh, and the Everybody In initiative uh, in lockdown one, uh, when uh, people who were homeless were offered accommodation in hotels uh, and other locations, with then particularly in London and, and no doubt elsewhere, uh, wraparound support uh, in, in the hope that at the end of lockdown one, uh, people could be moved on uh, into other forms of temporary or more permanent accommodation rather than uh, returning to the streets. So an illustration uh, of um, the context in which adult safeguarding is situated and a recognition uh, that some change has to be driven um, by central government um, uh, because the kinds of changes needed are beyond the scope of individual SABs uh, to achieve. So two sets of findings um, uh, which I'm going to run through. Um, uh, so findings in relation to the governance of, of SARS um, and then findings in relation to uh, what emerged from the 231 uh, cases about the effectiveness of multi-agency working uh, in response to different types um, of abuse uh, and neglect. So starting with um, uh, the governance of uh, safeguarding uh, uh, adult uh, reviews. One of the things that actually isn't on this slide um, uh, is that it is uh, quite common for safeguarding adult boards uh, to consider whether cases uh, should be uh, the subject of safeguarding uh, adult reviews on receipt of referrals. Um, if you actually look in the statutory guidance, it does not refer to referrals at all. Uh, it simply refers to boards having to decide uh, whether either the mandatory or the discretionary criteria in Section 44 are met. Um, and I made this uh, point, I think, yesterday, and, and I make it again now because uh, I was contacted by a business manager, not from the Eastern region, uh, but from elsewhere in England, uh, asking for advice about uh, how the SAB should respond uh, in relation to a case that it had been notified about, but where it had not received a formal referral. Um, and my advice was that the SAB should consider uh, that case for a safeguarding adult review against the criteria in Section 44 um, of the Care Act, um, despite the fact that no agency had formally referred the case uh, for consideration as a SAR. In other words, the SAB knew something and it couldn't unknow it. One of the um, uh, key points uh, that emerged from the analysis is in Box 1.1. Um, there were references uh, in SARS to statutory and non-statutory uh, reviews. That is a misunderstanding of Section 44 of the Act. 
an accurate understanding of section 44 of the Act is that if the criteria in sections 44 subsections 1, 2 and 3 are met, you have no choice but you must commission a review and that review is mandatory. Section 44 subsection 4 allows you to consider any case for a review even when the mandatory criteria are not met and in that sense all reviews are statutory. What you then have discretion uh, to decide is what kind of review to undertake. Uh, the, uh, the statutory guidance is very clear uh, that it is for the SAB to decide what methodology, what approach uh, to use. So, for example, uh, if you have uh, commissioned one or more reviews, uh, if you have completed one or more reviews already on self-neglect, you may nonetheless have to commission an, uh, another review on self-neglect because the mandatory criteria um, are met. But then how you approach the review of that case is for you to determine. Uh, and you might determine that rather than go through the whole SAR process that you might otherwise go through, you adopt a more proportionate uh, methodology, perhaps by asking uh, questions like what has changed and what has not changed since we did the last review on self-neglect and therefore what do we need to find out in relation to this new case? Where are the obstacles? Where are the barriers? Uh, uh, where is transformational change uh, still necessary and why uh, is it uh, still necessary? 1.2 highlights that decision making right throughout the process has got to be timely. Um, you are not uh, formally bound to complete a review within six months, although you are um, uh, guided by the statutory guidance to do your best uh, to do that. But there may well be positive reasons for delay as opposed to more negative reasons such as we couldn't make up our minds or we hadn't got a procedure that was functional um, um, uh, or the case just drifted. Um, so uh, again, SAB business managers, SAB chairs um, uh, need to ensure uh, that decision making is timely and where there is delay for whatever reason, it is for positive reasons such as the uh, conclusion of criminal uh, investigations or criminal proceedings uh, or indeed uh, coroner's inquests. Um, so recording uh, positive uh, reasons uh, for delay alongside um, recording the reasons for all of the decisions that you take, including uh, the methodology that you have decided to use, uh, how you have approached the involvement uh, of uh, individuals themselves uh, where they are still alive, and how you have approached the whole question um, of uh, family uh, involvement, all the way through to how you decide uh, whether or not to publish the full report or an executive summary or just a seven minute briefing. All of that needs to be formally recorded because uh, SAB's decision making can be scrutinised by the local government and social care ombudsman and indeed that has uh, happened. Um, uh, and SAB decision making can also be the subject of a judicial review uh, in the High Court. Uh, to give you an example of an ombudsman investigation, uh, West Sussex uh, did a SAR on Gary and Matthew. Uh, it is in the public domain uh, and that was the subject of a local government and social care ombudsman uh, investigation, not least because family members were not happy about uh, the level of participation uh, which they had been offered and specifically how much time they were given uh, to comment uh, on the contents of uh, the SAR report um, before it was published. There are also clear requirements in the statutory guidance in relation to what you should put in annual reports. Um, so I would strongly recommend uh, that 
um, business managers and SAB chairs um, uh, are mindful of what is in the, the statutory guidance about annual reports and the reporting therein of, of SARS um, because uh, some boards uh, are not compliant uh, with uh, what, um, the requirements in, um, in the statutory guidance. So uh, there are um, a considerable number of uh, points here uh, about how SABs manage the whole process of, um, of SARS from commissioning through to completion. Uh, and uh, you may have uh, observations, comments or indeed questions about that area of uh, findings uh, when I've got to the conclusion of the presentation. And just to give you uh, an example, this is not a slide that I used yesterday, um, uh, but I was uh, asked to do a presentation um, uh, to a conference organised by a national advocacy organisation. Uh, and so I looked um, uh, uh, in our uh, substantial database for references to advocacy. Um, and on this slide, uh, you will see uh, that there were uh, six uh, cases uh, where um, SARS made comments on advocacy as part and parcel of the SAR process. So where an individual is still alive and um, is being offered the opportunity to contribute uh, to um, uh, the Safeguarding Adult Review, uh, would that individual uh, benefit from does that individual have a statutory right to uh, advocacy uh, in order to participate uh, as fully as possible uh, in, in the SAR um, process? Uh, and you can see on this slide uh, both examples uh, where advocacy was offered uh, and, and how effectively that was used. Uh, but equally occasions where advocacy perhaps should have been offered uh, and uh, and was not. Um, or examples of where advocacy was considered, um, but there were delays because of an insufficient um, supply of availability of uh, advocates, which is perhaps something that um, SABs uh, from time to time should check out the adequacy of uh, advocacy provision um, and indeed um, uh, uh, whether advocacy uh, is considered uh, when it when it needs to be. So this is uh, one slide. There will be others uh, later on uh, where I'm drawing from uh, a substantial data set which is summarised in um, uh, in in the 200 page report. Um, um, but the data can be cut in a number of ways. Uh, so um, I was asked um, yesterday um, uh, for uh, data on domestic abuse cases involving older adults uh, and I've said that I will go back to the database uh, to see what I can lift out of it uh, in relation to domestic abuse involving older adults. So you may uh, have um, uh, questions about, well, what does the data um, say about this particular um, issue um, uh, and uh, if you can't find sufficient information uh, in, um, in, in the report uh, you can always ask us to explore the database um, further uh, to see what we can find for you. So turning to uh, the second uh, tranche of uh, analysis, the 231 uh, cases, uh, you'll see that that involved 263 uh, subjects, uh, partly because uh, um, uh, some individuals were living in care settings uh, that were the subject of uh, whole home uh, SAR reviews, uh, for example, uh, and, and clearly some individuals live with family members um, uh, who were also included uh, within the SAR process. So uh, more individuals than cases. Um, gender not always specified uh, and it puzzled me uh, somewhat uh, that uh, reviews did not always uh, specify uh, whether the focus was uh, male or female or indeed uh, transgender. 
One thing I would certainly want to highlight and which I would strongly recommend we pay immediate attention to is that there was very little information in reviews about sexuality or ethnicity. And in the context, for example, of Black Lives Matter uh, and in a much longer preoccupation, <clears throat> certainly within social work, of uh, anti-discriminatory and anti-oppressive practice, it saddens me that there were uh, there was so little consideration of the impact of ethnicity, a person's race, culture, religion, language. Uh, so little consideration of the impact of of all of that on how services understood individuals and indeed attempted to work with them. And I'll give you just one example of something that actually is not in the national analysis. It's much more recent. Um, I'm uh, just about to conclude um, a SAR um, that I've been commissioned uh, to write. And the one of the individuals involved in that SAR, I was told, uh, was Turkish Cypriot. In fact, it emerges that that individual was not Turkish Cypriot, but was Roma Cypriot. Uh, and uh, I've been fortunate enough to benefit from uh, the advice and guidance of, as it happens, an elected member who is herself uh, from uh, the Roma Cypriot uh, community. Uh, and she has identified uh, the differences um, uh, between uh, Roma Cypriot uh, community, the Turkish Cypriot community, the Greek Cypriot community, and how that plays out, how those differences play out, uh, particularly for members of uh, the Roma Cypriot community, both on the island of Cyprus, but also uh, in the UK, uh, where um, uh, a number uh, of members of these communities uh, have settled uh, particularly since the civil war uh, in Cyprus uh, some years ago. Um, I have found very little consideration of that individual's ethnicity, cultural uh, heritage, um, uh, language and so on, beyond a recognition that wherever possible interpreters should be present uh, in, in order to assist a person to engage um, uh, with uh, assessments uh, and service uh, provision. So how assured are you that sufficient consideration is being given to race, culture, religion, language, ethnicity, as indeed is required by the Equality Act 2010? There are some other um, uh, uh, demographic pieces um, of, of information uh, here. Um, the location of abuse very much uh, influenced by uh, the number of cases involving self-neglect, as indeed you can see uh, where when you look at um, perpetrators. Um, but given that 30% of the cases involved care providers as perpetrators, the fact that um, uh, there were uh, far fewer successful prosecutions is in fact uh, um, something perhaps that uh, that SABS might choose to look at uh, much more carefully in terms of how we can all contribute to achieving best evidence uh, for our police colleagues uh, uh, in, in cases that they might then submit to the Crown Prosecution Service uh, for consideration of moving to trial. And here is um, uh, how the 231 cases played out uh, in terms of um, uh, the different types of abuse and neglect. Um, and as some of you will know, I've done an awful lot of work, some of it with Susie Bray on, uh, on self-neglect. And uh, I know Susie has done uh, reviews uh, for some of you uh, in, in the east of England. Um, uh, and indeed, uh, we have both done reviews on self-neglect for different SABs uh, in England. We've long suspected that self-neglect was the biggest uh, focus uh, of safeguarding adult reviews. And now we have uh, the evidential proof of that. Uh, so 45% of cases 
um, contained uh, self-neglect. Uh, and uh, those of you who were present at the webinar yesterday will know that in some regions, uh, actually the figure uh, was uh, over 50% of cases uh, in that particular region um, uh, involving self-neglect. And as you will see, if you have read um, uh, the, uh, the full report, um, uh, we give a, a regional breakdown um, not least in this particular area, but also uh, in relation to uh, other aspects of the quantitative data. So you can see how the eastern region compares uh, with uh, other regions uh, in England. A number of observations to make um, about, uh, about the figures. It isn't always clear from SARS whether um, the SAR uh, is looking at neglect and omissions of care and or organisational um, abuse. This is a particular reference to reviews where the focus is on a care home uh, or uh, some other kind of care setting where it isn't always clear whether uh, this is an omission of care or neglect by one or more uh, individual staff members uh, in a particular setting or whether it uh, uh, either in addition uh, or uh, instead of this is an example of uh, organizational uh, institutional um, abuse so greater clarity in that area would certainly assist with uh, with understanding there were situations that we would have regarded as domestic abuse, which were not recorded as such, um, but actually were recorded as financial or physical um, abuse uh, or psychological abuse. Um, so there is something about naming um, specifically uh, the types of abuse uh, that might be involved uh, in a particular case. And I would make the same point about discriminatory abuse. Only two cases specifically referenced discriminatory abuse. There were, in fact, more cases involving hate crime and mate crime, uh, for example, um, that I would class as discriminatory abuse, but were not formally recorded um, as such uh, in the SAR. So again, uh, when SABs uh, are overseeing the whole process um, uh, of, uh, of, of a SAR, um, uh, making sure that uh, there is clarity um, about uh, the types of abuse or neglect uh, that are in uh, the frame uh, for analysis. One other final observation in relation to this slide would be that we need consistently to be asking ourselves a question, and that is whether what we are finding in a particular case is actually emblematic of wider systemic uh, failings or systemic issues. In other words, is this case an example um, rather than uh, a unique uh, case? Is this case an example of of wider uh, systemic uh, challenges uh, that are being faced by one or more of the organisations involved. Uh, and again, just to illustrate that um, uh, the data can be cut uh, in a number of, uh, of different ways. Um, I did a presentation uh, for Alcohol Change UK uh, as part of some developmental work that uh, Mike Ward, who is a consultant for Alcohol Change UK, and I are doing on adult safeguarding uh, with uh, people uh, who have alcohol dependency. Uh, I went back and looked at the data in relation to alcohol-related SARS. Uh, so here you can see that there were 57 cases, 25% of the sample where the principal focus was on a person with alcohol related uh, issues. You can see that there were correlations with self neglect and homelessness. You can see that there were correlations with uh, fire deaths. Um, uh, and perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, the uh, impact of loss and trauma uh, on uh, someone's uh, use and or misuse um, of, of substances. 
So again, it is just an example of how the data uh, can be cut. And um, once again, to uh, reiterate that if uh, you find yourselves um, uh, looking at a referral for a safeguarding adult review, and you're wondering what uh, evidence there is um, uh, nationally about uh, a particular issue, uh, you could always come back to us um, uh, to look at the database again. Um, uh, but equally, for those of you who are practitioners and operational managers, um, uh, if you are uh, struggling with a particular case, whether it's about alcohol, homelessness, uh, uh, risk of fire, um, uh, whatever, uh, if if you can't find um, uh, what you are looking for in the uh, full report, uh, you could again um, always ask us um, uh, for uh, information from uh, the data set that we've got. Um, I provided that uh, at the end of last week for a fire and rescue service uh, in the south of England uh, who were doing work on um, the prevention of fire deaths, uh, particularly but not just in cases of hoarding, uh, and they wanted to look at um, uh, SARS uh, where uh, fire deaths uh, had been uh, a particular focus uh, and I was able to provide information about SARS that are in the public domain uh, where fire has uh, where fire was uh, the cause of death. So um, uh, I ought to speed up a little perhaps. Um, uh, good practice. Uh, there were findings in relation to uh, to good practice. The numbers relate to the number of references within uh, the 231 uh, reviews uh, that we considered. Uh, and uh, you can see four of the domains uh, represented uh, on this slide. Um, Particularly uh, pleasing, I think, to see uh, the number of occasions where uh, either primary care and or acute care uh, were responding um, uh, positively and proactively uh, to the health needs that were being presented um, by an individual. Um, heartening, too, to see that personalization and making safeguarding personal featured uh, quite strongly uh, in um, in, in good practice uh, references um, and perhaps also pleasing to see uh, that mental capacity uh, assessments um, uh, did gain mention in relation to examples of good practice, not least because as you'll see shortly, mental capacity is the number one direct practice issue uh, where there are significant uh, concerns. Heartening too to see that uh, there were at least some uh, good examples of information sharing and accurate appreciations, therefore, of when the Data Protection Act 2018 does allow uh, lawfully the sharing of uh, proportionate uh, information. Uh, good examples occasionally of management oversight um, of, of complex cases and that is so incredibly uh, important. Uh, in relation to ASAR, that again, I'm just uh, completing, although it's different from the one I mentioned um, a few moments ago, uh, there is an interim director of adult social services uh, in that particular authority. Uh, and uh, when she was reflecting on the learning emerging from the SAR um, that I have written, she said how surprised she was and how disappointed she was uh, that when on arrival in that local authority, she asked the head of adult safeguarding to talk her through uh, the 10 cases that were most uh, worrying uh, for adult safeguarding colleagues. Uh, she was met with a, um, a blank face. The head of adult safeguarding could not talk about the 10 most worrying cases uh, in that particular local authority area. The head of adult safeguarding does now talk weekly with the DAS about the 10 cases that are um, um, most worrying uh, to adult safeguarding so that there is very senior management oversight and where necessary uh, intervention uh, to attempt to make progress uh, in a particular case. 
And again, uh, just to show how we can cut the data in different ways, um, um, uh, this is a slide I produced for Alcohol Change UK and the webinar that I produced there. It, again, it just gives you a flavour of uh, some of the examples uh, of good practice in relation to uh, alcohol-related reviews um, across, uh, across the domains. So references to thorough and robust care and support assessments, risk assessments, mental capacity assessments, challenging though uh, all of those can be with alcohol uh, relate, uh, alcohol dependent uh, individuals. Um, routine monitoring and treatment of physical health issues by primary care in particular. Uh, and good example of liaison with drug and alcohol teams rather than as we often encounter uh, the revolving door scenario. Perhaps not surprisingly, because SARS are often commissioned because there are concerns about how services work together, there were many more mentions of poor practice or practice shortfalls, perhaps is, is a better way of putting it, um, across the four domains. Um, and um, again, the numbers in brackets refer to the number of occasions where um, uh, reference was, uh, was made. So um, mental capacity assessments and risk assessments at the risk of embarrassing um, particularly Walter, uh, who's uh, present this afternoon. Uh, I know that when uh, Susie and I um, uh, were commissioned to provide self-neglect training in, in Norfolk, um, uh, the Norfolk board uh, and Walter in particular uh, had done work on, on risk assessments and indeed uh, Walter had taken the triangle of assessment um, uh, from working together with children requiring safeguarding and had adapted that uh, as one way of looking at risk uh, in an adult safeguarding um, uh, context. Um, there are different models, different uh, uh, approaches to risk assessment. Um, I think what matters is, is that uh, practitioners and operational managers uh, have templates which they can consider using as part and parcel of robust uh, risk assessments and conversations with individuals um, about uh, risks. Similarly, um, mental capacity, um, enormously challenging, not least because of the way in which the Mental Capacity Act uh, is configured. Um, uh, but there were many examples where capacity assessments were not done or the act itself was misunderstood. Um, uh, so uh, again, uh, if you're a SAB member, um, uh, you might be seeking assurance about the quality of mental capacity assessments and the accuracy of understanding uh, of the act uh, itself. And if you've got Alex Rookkeen coming to speak to you, then that's absolutely great um, because Alex is very hot on ensuring that we have an accurate understanding, um, particularly of the five principles uh, in the Mental Capacity Act and also on uh, Section 2, uh, the Diagnostic Test and Section 3, uh, the Functional Test and which comes first and it isn't Section 2. Uh, moving round, uh, considerable concerns as you can see um, about agencies not working together, um, that's the point about case coordination, uh, concerns about misunderstandings of the Data Protection Act 2018 and its predecessor legislation, many examples where Section 42 of the CARE Act um, uh, should have been used uh, um, and, and wasn't. And I can just give you one very, very recent example of that um, in relation to uh, one of the reviews that I have mentioned that I'm in the process of, uh, of completing. And it was uh, an adult safeguarding team uh, that received uh, a number of adult safeguarding concerns under Section 42 of the CARE Act in relation to a person uh, who was self-neglecting and homeless. And the reason why a Section 42 inquiry was not conducted 
uh, was that the adult safeguarding team had adopted a policy that it did not do section 42 inquiries in relation to people who are homeless. That is an unlawful position uh, to adopt, as I'm sure you all know. But there were many examples where the criteria for an inquiry in section 42.1 of the CARE Act were met, but no inquiry um, pursued, um, uh, ensued. So again, that is an area perhaps where all of us uh, should be seeking assurance about um, uh, the safety of our um, of our procedures. Moving round, um, fewer examples than I would have expected of concerns about staffing and particularly concerns um, about workloads, although there were examples um, both in relation to primary care, particularly the workloads being carried by district nurses and tissue viability nurses, but also concern about the workloads being carried um, by uh, social workers and social care workers in adult social care. Um, alongside concern about the use of agency staff and the support, induction, training and so forth that were being provided uh, for people who were employed uh, from agencies. Concerns about management oversight, so I reiterate the story I told a moment or two ago about an interim DAS and what she found in a particular local authority um, uh, area. And then moving round to uh, SAB governance, um, uh, some practice shortfalls identified in relation to the guidance that SABs were making available about different aspects of adult safeguarding, not least self-neglect, uh, use of escalation, guidance on risk assessment, but also some concerns about how SABs were managing SARs and whether um, uh, SAR policies and procedures uh, uh, either existed at all or indeed if they did exist uh, were fit for purpose. And again applying this to um, alcohol related um, uh, reviews uh, you can see again and we will make these slides available I shall send them to Howard and Paul uh, immediately after um, uh, this event this afternoon um, so that they can be uh, disseminated to you all um, either by being posted on a website or indeed being emailed out to you uh, and I have no objection to any of to these slides being used if they're at all useful uh, to you uh, please do uh, do use them but here you can see across three of the four domains uh, the practice shortfalls that were identified in the 57 reviews that focused on alcohol related uh, issues. Then recommendations uh, and it's important to bear in mind here that you know um, a recommendation uh, may emerge from a practice shortfall the practice shortfall might for example be in the area of direct work but the recommendation actually might be made uh, in one of the other uh, three uh, domains uh, for example um, uh, the practice shortfall might be around mental capacity assessments but the recommendation actually might be uh, for further training on mental capacity act assessments or indeed management oversight supervisory oversight of uh, of the quality or otherwise um, of assessments that are being uh, conducted. So you can see the range of uh, recommendations um, across uh, the different uh, domains. And what does all of this uh, tell us? And um, I've inserted here some uh, some slides um, uh, with, I think, a, uh, a message which is intended to be hopeful. Um, and that is we do have uh, an emerging evidence base uh, about what good looks like. Uh, and again, there are four slides uh, um, uh, to represent each of the first uh, four uh, domains. So we do know about the importance of thorough, robust and regularly reviewed mental capacity assessments. Um, uh, so the question then is about why, if this appears to be the case, um, a, a particular organisation, particular practitioners um, did not get close 
uh, to what our expect our legitimate expectations would be of mental capacity assessments. Um, we do know um, about the importance of not taking at face value the whole idea of lifestyle choice, um, but interrogating it um, uh, much more fully. We do know about the importance of professional curiosity. We do know about the importance of thinking family, um, uh, of understanding relationships between the individual and members of their family and uh, social networks. And we do know about the importance of transitions, whether that is from children's social care to adult social care, uh, from prison uh, back into the community, um, uh, the transition of hospital uh, discharge, whether from an acute trust or, or from a mental health trust. Uh, there is uh, a substantial evidence base in relation to all of these areas of, of direct practice. Just to focus on one, the transition from children's social care to adult social care uh, and from children's mental health to adult mental health. Research in practice produced uh, a really helpful publication called Mind the Gap, which identifies the evidence base in relation to um, best transitions. Um, so again, we don't need to start from scratch. We can ask the question, if we know what the evidence base is, uh, what is getting in the way of us achieving our best evidence, best practice uh, in our particular location? And what light does a particular SAR uh, shine uh, on that particular question? Similarly, organisational factors, we know about the importance of supervision and managerial oversight. We know about the importance of escalation. Um, uh, we know about the importance of people having uh, manageable uh, workloads so that they have space for reflection and time to devote uh, uh, to uh, particularly challenging uh, and complex cases. We know about the importance of recording um, and having a clear line of sight on the chronology um, um, of a case. Um, we know about the importance of agencies having a culture uh, where it is OK to say that actually we need support, we need help, uh, we need access to specialist advice, whether that is from Mental Capacity Act specialists, mental health specialists, uh, or indeed uh, uh, lawyers uh, who can advise uh, on whether this case is a case for the Court of Protection uh, or indeed uh, the High Court. We know about the importance of not responding to referrals as discrete episodes, but actually looking to see whether the most recent episode is part of a pattern, because the pattern may be information that actually a fresh look at a case uh, is needed. We know what good looks like in relation to interagency cooperation. We know that silo working is something uh, to uh, avoid. We know about the importance of seeking and sharing uh, information uh, when it is lawful uh, to do so, um, as it often is. Uh, we know about the importance of holding uh, each other accountable uh, for uh, the standards um, of, of provision. And we know about the importance of using Section 42 of the Act uh, lawfully and the importance of considering all of the legal options that might be available uh, in a particular case. And we know what good SAB governance looks like, um, both in relation to the conduct of SARS, but actually also uh, more generally in relation to seeking assurance um, uh, that um, what we know about best practice uh, is, is being modelled um, by partner agencies. And then the fifth system. Uh, that I highlighted earlier in relation to the Everybody In uh, initiative um, uh, in relation to homeless people. There were very few SARS within the sample, less than 25%, less than a quarter of the SARS that paid any attention at all to the legal policy and financial context within which adult safeguarding uh, is situated. Um, and I think that is a major omission. 
So again, for those of you who are working closely with or are indeed business managers or independent chairs, uh, looking at particular cases to see whether those cases shine a light on this fifth domain, the legal policy uh, and financial context, and whether actually some of the recommendations should be directed to national bodies, uh, whether they are central government departments or organisations like the Care Quality Commission, um, uh, whether recommendations should be directed there uh, as opposed to um, partner agencies within a, a, a local SAB, uh, because some things will be beyond uh, uh, the uh, scope of an individual SAB uh, to achieve. So this slide uh, identifies that there were uh, occasions, rare occasions, but there were occasions when recommendations were directed towards um, uh, national uh, organisations and some of the issues that prompted those recommendations, such as the impact of financial austerity on the availability of specialist drug and alcohol uh, services, uh, for example, or uh, instances where the legal rules were felt to be uh, unhelpful. Uh, and one area there would be the fact that in England there is not an adult safeguarding power of entry, um, um, uh, although there is in Wales uh, and in Scotland. And again, uh, just to um, show uh, how one can cut the data in different ways, uh, here is a slide on advocacy. Uh, so on the left, as you look at it, the notable findings on advocacy, um, both good practice when that was recorded, but also practice uh, shortfalls uh, and then recommendations about advocacy uh, on the right hand side um, of the slide. Um, so whereas I have presented uh, good practice and practice shortfalls and recommendations thus far, um, as it were, generically, uh, here is an example of, of how the findings and the recommendations played out uh, in relation to um, a specific uh, issue. And perhaps we should remind ourselves that the first judicial review uh, that took place uh, after the CARE Act was implemented um, uh, actually uh, turned on the uh, non-provision uh, of advocacy uh, when the individual did have an entitlement, uh, as it happened, to Care Act advocacy, uh, which uh, the local authority, um, London Borough of Haringey, in fact, uh, had um, neglected uh, to uh, consider. So if you've read the executive summary or the full report, you will know that there are 28 priorities uh, that we've identified. Many of these uh, are directed to uh, individual SABs uh, to, to take forward. Uh, I chaired a meeting of the London SAB chairs uh, this morning, uh, and I know that all of the SABs uh, in London are looking at the priorities uh, reviewing their policies uh, and their procedures uh, and their practices, um, as, which relates to uh, the priorities listed under commissioning and conduct um, um, of, of SARS. Um, uh, so uh, hopefully um, the SABs in the eastern region uh, will indeed uh, be doing uh, the same. So where are we now? Considerably uh, some way up the staircase uh, towards uh, uh, sector-led uh, improvement. Um, uh, the online publication is now available. It's on the LGA uh, website. Uh, we are producing uh, seven-minute briefings uh, for with uh, for different groupings, and they will be um, available uh, in early 2021, uh, also on the LGA uh, website, and we will let everybody know when they are available. The published report was formally launched uh, yesterday, and some of you were present for that. Um, and we will... Um, uh, at some point uh, uh, in 2021, uh, release uh, the database once we have removed from it 
all of the information that was provided to us uh, in the strictest uh, confidence. So there were some unpublished uh, SARS uh, that were made available on the basis that we would not release any information that enabled uh, those SARS uh, to be identified. So we do want the database to be useful, but we have to respect uh, the condition in which some of the information was supplied to us. So we are uh, shortly to commence uh, cleansing, for want of a better word, uh, the database so that when we do uh, ultimately make it available, probably through research in practice, um, it will only contain uh, information and analysis of those cases that are in the public uh, domain. So, um, some questions that you might want uh, to reflect on. Um, uh, both now and and indeed uh, subsequently, um, but I've I've already talked for longer than I was uh, expecting to, uh, and I've left us only about uh, three quarters of an hour for uh, comments, questions, uh, observations, uh, and so on. Um, so there are uh, our contact details, both Susie's uh, and and mine. Thank you for listening. And um, I will now uh, come back into um, the whole room um, and um, look at the chat function and um, be prepared to take uh, questions. So, Paul, you might have been looking at the chat function as I was talking and you may be able already to identify things you want me to comment on. Um, um, and then perhaps once I've given you that opportunity, we should see whether anyone wishes to use the hand function. Yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. Um, um, so I thought I've, I've, I've got a strange hypo at this end there with you. Um, um, I don't know if you want to stop sharing your screen as well, Michael. Um, ah, should I? OK. Um, uh, uh, right, I may have to. Um, uh, That's it, you got it. There we go. Yeah. Is that all right? I'm, I'm not the most technically minded individual, so I have to be guided through these um, uh, through these things. But OK, if that if that has done the job, then great. So there's, there's quite a, a specific question from um, Rabbi Deloso around of the 104 self-neglect SARS you looked at, how many of them had MCAs completed and how many of these MCAs are deemed poorly performed and not reviewed? So maybe not that specific answer, but maybe a, a more general, uh, a more general response. Uh, well, I can't give a, a specific answer to uh, Rabbi Deloso without actually going back to the database and doing all of the counting um, uh, again. Um, uh, but I think it's fair to say that um, almost all of the 104 cases should have prompted a mental capacity assessment, um, uh, even if they did not do so. Um, uh, some of the SARS commented positively on attempts to assess capacity in situations where capacity might fluctuate, for example. Um, there were examples where um, the whole notion of lifestyle choice was scrutinized, where there was curiosity uh, about um, what we might capture within that um, misleading phrase. Um, but there were many examples where capacity assessments were either not done at all uh, or were done and then not reviewed. Um, so if someone had done a capacity assessment at some point in time and said this person has capacity and they're making a lifestyle choice, um, uh, that that was never revisited. Um, uh, and indeed occasions where people were saying person has capacity, there is nothing we can do. And of course, that's wrong in law, potentially. Um, uh, one has to consider all of the legal options. Uh, and there were examples when that um, when that didn't happen. OK, a, a, a rather more, um, I think to some extent we, we covered this one um, during the presentation, but why why do you think we don't consider ethnicity? 
Well, I think if I'm honest, uh, at least some of the time, because of unconscious bias and because of the application of stereotypes and assumptions um, um, and I think I have evidence for, you know, for, 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 for saying that. Um, I think there are examples of where individuals within an authority, where the authority might have committed itself to what I as a social worker by background would call anti-discriminatory and anti-oppressive practice, uh, authorities that might have committed themselves to challenging uh, what we know of uh, the hostile environment that nonetheless there are individuals within those local authorities that don't subscribe to that point of view. Um, uh, so I think we have to call it out, to be honest, uh, where, where we see it, uh, where we see it existing. Um, uh, and, and, and we also have to recognise that um, we all have an awful lot to learn. Uh, I have to confess in relation to the example I gave um, relating to the island of Cyprus, I didn't know that there was a community that was Roma Cypriot. Um, mm. I therefore, as a reviewer, had a lot to learn if I was then accurately going to hold to account the, the services that um, that were working with that particular individual who equally may not have known of the significance of of the difference between um, a member of the Roma Cypriot community uh, and uh, and and uh, the Turkish Cypriot uh, community. So I also think we have to recognise that all of us, to a greater or lesser extent, um, are are on a journey of learning, um, um, and 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 we should expect that of each other. Yeah, no, absolutely. VJ just given an example there of um, yeah. one where they've told an Asian man. In fact, yeah, we've, okay. had, we've had we've uh, had one in Essex where we were told it was, it was a guy from Iran, and it turned out it was a guy from Iraq. Um, you know, the, these things seem to come up on a, on a fairly regular um, basis. So it's certainly something we can do some some work and some thoughts around. Um, most of the other comments were were kind of um, were comments rather than questions. A, a definite plea there for a, a link to the Mind the Gap um, research report. Um, which hopefully somebody can provide. That would be great. Um, I noticed that Paula Yule's got her hand up. So Paula, would you like to come in at this point? Um, yes, thank you, Paul. Um, so I suppose my hand's up through frustration and um, through uh, just, uh, do you know what? Sometimes we've had these conversations about mental capacity for years now. And, and what you've raised here. Uh, Michael is is really spotlighted the key issues that we have faced now for what is now relatively uh, mature legislation. Let's face it; it's not it's not something that that's new, and yet what we we're seeing locally, regionally, and nationally, an absolute need to. Uh, raise the game when it comes to mental capacity, knowledge and confidence across, across all systems partners. This isn't just a local authority issue, a social work issue. You know, we've seen this across health partners, police, the voluntary sector, all areas where mental capacity is everybody's business and we absolutely need to raise the game. And I'm, I'm one, you know, what we do need, I think now, I mean, we're, we're working in Suffolk on a, um, a, a, a programme of work we want to launch in the new year, a, 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 an awareness week, which is an alignment with the um, human rights week. That's not going to be, that's not going to crack this. And how do we raise the game with a national challenge here? How do we raise this with the key people who we need their ear to say, let's do something different to raise the game nationally, to really drive this forward. Um, and, and I mean, you can tell my vo my voice has gone up octaves here, so I always <laughs> clearly it's, it's hit, hit, a, hit a sweet spot there. So I'm, I'm welcoming your thoughts on that, Michael. Right, uh, okay. Um, well, my, my, 
one immediate thought is that Alex Wakefield in the Department of Health and Social Care is the lead civil servant responsible for uh, mental capacity and dolls and therefore liberty protection safeguards going forward. Uh, the guidance for uh, LPS is in the process of development, as I understand it, and will be out for consultation around April 2021. Um, and I also understand that aspects of the Code of Practice for the, Act, uh, the Mental Capacity Act more generally is also um, uh, the subject of some uh, revision at the moment. Uh, so if there are examples um, where you think uh, the guidance on the Mental Capacity Act could be strengthened, um, uh, then I think um, making contact with Alex Wakefield in DHSC um, as a SAB or as a regional group of SABs um, uh, is, is one thing to do. Um, I'm, whenever I have an opportunity to talk with, uh, with Alex and colleagues in DHSC, as I do have at the moment, because we are working through where DHSC can support uh, the priorities that we've identified, um, I do take um, uh, opportunities to do that. I think the second uh, area um, uh, is that one can look at not just the training that one is providing, uh, but how does the workplace need to be developed to enable practitioners to implement the training that they've received? Because if the workplace is not aligned to enable practitioners to implement uh, the knowledge and the skills that they've acquired through training, um, uh, then the the impact of the training will decay um, and will decay quite quickly. Um, so, for example, you know, are we providing peer support? Are we providing reflective spaces uh, where particularly people new to mental capacity assessments uh, can talk through uh, the whole process of doing assessments, um, can talk through the challenges that they experienced can can ask for guidance um, ab about how to uh, complete assessments in particularly challenging uh, situations. And then the third, I think, is, uh, and this is where people like Alex Rootkeen are so useful, it's to make sure that people have accurate Mental Capacity Act training. And I'll give you an example, uh, Paula. Yeah. Uh, I, I was doing a um, a, a, a seminar actually uh, on behalf of a SAB in Wales uh, and I referred to the diagnostic test in section two and the functional test in section three of the act. So section two, does a, per, does a person have an impairment in, in the functioning of the mind or brain and the functional test, uh, can the person understand, retain, use or weigh uh, and communicate a decision? And I said, that the balance of judicial opinion, uh, not least from the Court of Appeal, is that you start with the functional test. And if you have any reason to doubt a person's ability to understand, retain, use or way uh, and uh, or communicate, you then ask the question, is this because of, that's the language the Act use, uses, an impairment in the functioning of the mind or brain? And two people in the audience said, that's not how we've been trained. We've been trained to start with the diagnostic test. So I use that as one example of uh, where Alex and others, um, and hopefully also myself uh, to a degree, uh, um, can, can provide an accurate, up-to-date understanding of the interpretation of the Mental Capacity Act. Thank you, Michael. That has been really useful and uh, certainly a lot of food for thought there. I'll, I'll uh, allow others. I've, I've got plenty I'd want to say, but I'll let, <laughs> I'll let others uh, chip in because I know they'll want to. Thank you. OK, and I can see that Gary has his hand up, so I don't know whether it's a follow on Gary or something separate. But as you've got your hand up and I can't see any other hands, uh, we may as well ask you. Thank you, Michael. Um, you led in nicely, actually, because I was going to echo Paula's comments with relation to the frustrations that we have. Um, so I, as a health professional, 
recognise that we need to raise our game um, with regard to the Mental Capacity Act. And as Paula says, it's not it's a, a fairly mature piece of legislation now. We can't just simply refer to it as relatively new or, or otherwise. Previous role I was in provided, uh, I was a safeguarding leading provider land, now I'm commissioning. Um, and when in provider land, I taught at a local university, um, all of our sort of uh, our health students. And so I think there's something about approaching the deaneries and ensuring that the Mental Capacity Act is really firmly embedded in grassroots training for health and social care professionals. Um, because if we build in that value, that it's not a bolt on to something that we otherwise do. This is core business from day, day one of our practice. And secondary, I'm pushing to have students from the academic world um, come into commissioning because we are forgotten about, I think sometimes we get students coming to uh, provider placements. And when I was a provider uh, lead for safeguarding, I would be walking around grabbing students, going, come and shadow me for a day in safeguarding and see what we do from the safeguarding perspective. Now, I recognise there's a limitation on capacity for colleagues to do that, small teams, large cohorts of students. But I think it really helpful that, that as you referred to, Michael, having the environment that supports the training so that we move from this, um, this theory to practice and we close that gap, because you you are diluting it. If you've got somebody that perhaps doesn't fully understand the application of legislation, teaching somebody to then follow on, see one, do one, teach one, we, we, we're inherently diluting the knowledge base. So I think there's something there about safeguarding as a function in our specialist uh, roles, supporting that. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I, I mean, I think having students placed in, in with, with uh, commissioners is is valuable if for no other reason that when when practitioners have qualified and gone into uh, the workplace if they perceive gaps uh, in in commissioning um uh, they can exercise leadership and highlight what they perceive to be a gap uh, uh, in provision um uh, and perhaps that's uh, easier to do if they've had uh, uh input from commissioners as part of their professional formation so uh, yeah gary i'm on the same page with you uh, with okay. you there thanks Michael. Um, I, I see carolyn caroline has put something in the chat about any best practice regarding imr writer training um <coughs> excuse me um there were sars uh, that did positively commend safeguarding adult boards caroline for having uh, run training courses uh, for um, uh, for IMR writers, um, not least to um, identify the importance of IMR writers being critically reflective uh, of what they find in their own organisations. Um, so being really clear with IMR writers about what best practice might look like and then how uh, IMR writers can contribute to that analysis by being critically reflective for want of a better phrase, being critical friends to their own organisation. Um, so certainly for people who are new to the IMR process uh, and perhaps for some people who've been around it for a while, uh, having opportunities to reflect on the challenges indeed um, of being a critical friend to one's own organisation um, you know, and, and trying to establish a culture that, that is about learning lessons um, rather than about pointing fingers of blame. Uh, it's not an easy role for IMR writers to hold um, and is perhaps something that deserves uh, more attention from SABs um, and the provision of, uh, of reflective spaces. And I say that in the context of two SABs that I chair, um, uh, we kind of allocate responsibilities to IMR writers and just leave them to get on with it, um, you know, and then we receive something back and we might be critically reflective on what we receive back. Um, we're perhaps not as good as we can be at actually supporting IMR writers to do what we really need them to do, because when you do get a critically reflective contribution, um, uh, that is enormously helpful. Um, and I can think, but particularly um, uh, of one SAR that I wrote a number of years ago, where the contribution from uh, the relevant police force was outstanding in terms of critical reflection, both about what the police did in a particular case, 
but actually also offering some reflections about how the police uh, worked alongside other agencies and services involved in that case. It was so, so helpful uh, to have the critical um, analysis um, uh, from the police in that particular case. I'm not sure if that helps, Caroline, but a few observations anyway. Thank um, you. There's also another question there from um, from Walter. Um, very much welcoming your thoughts on on legal and policy con legal and policy context, um, and particularly, is there one thing that we as colleagues on this call could do to strengthen our voice at a national level for greater mm -hmm. safeguards and adults' influence? Well, I think the one thing that we can do, Walter, is is to continue the um, direction of travel that you and your colleague Lindsay Bampton in in Leicestershire and Rutland um, um, have begun. You've um, you know been um, uh, quite a leader in terms of getting the business manager SAB network uh, into a shape where. Uh, you could actually make representations on behalf of the network uh, to, for example, the Department of um, Health and Social Care. I think there's greater collaboration now between the Business Manager Network and the Chairs Network um, nationally. And certainly in London, um, uh, when I chair the London Regional Group of Chairs, uh, we now have a representative uh, from the Business Manager Network in the London region. Um, uh, so we are uh, we are closely aligned, um, and when as a London region we make representations, uh, we are doing that in the full knowledge that the business managers are on the same page as the independent chairs. Um, so I think that's one thing we can do. I think the other thing that we can do is that we just have to take every single opportunity we can. Uh, one of the opportunities at the moment is the national analysis. I've had two meetings with Alex Wakefield and uh, his civil servant colleagues in DHSC. I've had uh, um, a number of meetings with ADAS policy leads. Uh, we know that James Bullion, who is currently the president of ADAS and of course well known to you, Walter, in Norfolk, uh, is really enthusiastic about taking forward the, the learning from the national analysis. Um, uh, so it's about using um, ev every single opportunity we have. Um, so if you don't have a direct opportunity, but you think that I or A.D. Cooper or James uh, or others who occasionally meet uh, with um, national colleagues, if you think that we might have an opportunity to take forward an issue, then let us know what the issue is. That's great. Um as we don't have any other questions at the moment, I'm going to take advantage of the gap and ask a question myself. Um, so first of all, one of the things you said earlier was about um, having the opportunity to do further reviews of the um, of the database, which I think is something you may well regret offering. So I can, I can imagine there'll be quite a few people who have, have thoughts on that one. Um, and it would certainly be useful to, um, to have sight of the work you're doing around domestic abuse and older adults. It's an issue that's been that we've um, been thinking about quite a lot in Essex and about how we can take forward learning on that one. Um, so it'd be really useful to see that. Um, but then think thinking about something else. I think that with the, the um, with your report looks at the interface with other with other reviews. Um, so for example, the interface between domestic homicide reviews and safeguards and adult reviews, or um, maybe leader reviews, um, is certainly something we've been looking at in Essex, and we are doing. Um, joint SARS and DHRs in some circumstances um, and actually looking at where we have opportunities to get more involved in, in the leader reviews as well. So um, yeah, it'd be good to have your views on that one. Um, OK, well, if um, if Walter um, is happy with this, when I provide Walter with information about cases involving domestic abuse with older adults, um, I'll also copy you in. Is that all right, Walter, if I were to do that? Absolutely, Michael. Absolutely. Very happy with that, of course. OK, um, yeah. then then I'll do that. Um, I'll probably get to it at the weekend, if not before, Paul. So maybe something in your inbox early part of next week. Ooh, um, <laughs> a number of boards have got protocols uh, about how decisions are made when a referral could, could meet the criteria for a DHR. 
um, or um, a child safeguarding practice review uh, or a SAR. Um, uh, certainly we have that protocol in both Lewisham and in Brent uh, and I know a number of other London SABs have got um, similar protocols. Um, uh, so that's one thing to do. There, there are examples, as you've said, uh, where a SAR has been combined uh, with um, uh, with a DHR, for example. Um, um, so there are examples of that. Um, um, what else to say, really? Um, other than um, yes, do it if the criteria are met, um, um, and and I mean certainly there are things. To, I mean it's one of the things we talked about in the London regional meeting this morning. Um, there is learning from from children's services both about um, serious case reviews as they were, uh, and 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 how learning from serious case reviews could actually be translated across into adult services, not least around transition, um, but actually also about things like the rule of optimism, uh, the importance of thinking family. Uh, the importance of not starting again uh, each time you get um, a, a new referral. Um, uh, there are some cautionary messages. Um, uh, there's now a rapid review system in 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 children's safeguarding uh, before you get to a uh, a children's safeguarding practice review. And there's interest on the adult side about reviews in rapid time. Um, I think there are some cautionary tales um, uh, um, about rapid reviews or reviews in rapid time. Um, but so there are things that we can learn from each other. Um, and yes, having a protocol about how you make decisions uh, when reviews might meet criteria. Uh, I'd strongly recommend that if you don't have that in place already. Yeah, I mean, we certainly have it in place in Essex and we're also just putting in place a memor memorandum of understanding between ourselves and, and leader reviews as well and kind of how, yeah. they, how they work in terms of governance and um, decision making. So that's um, what well, it, it's in place, but it's going through the governance process in terms of formal approval. Yes, um, I mean, what, what we have what we have at the moment is uh, in the board, the two boards I chair. Uh, is that we have regular reports from the outcome of leader processes um, uh, to the SAB and there is an open pathway or channel of communication so that the lead person in the CCGs responsible for leader reviews can refer a case for a SAR uh, and then we determine how best to meet the leader criteria at the same time as how to meet um, the requirements of the SAR process. So we do have that. Um, we also have um, uh, the same arrangement with drug and alcohol related death reviews. Um, uh, so, uh, for example, in Lewisham, uh, the board gets quarterly reports on the outcome of drug and alcohol related death reviews. And again, uh, the public health employee whose responsibility it is to lead on those reviews knows that he can uh, refer a case for a SAR um uh, if he thinks the criteria might be met uh, either for a mandatory or a discretionary review so we are picking up more drug and alcohol related cases than 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 we were previously and in some places for example the london borough of haringey there's also now a fatality review process in relation to homeless people yeah. Um, which again is is a methodology which is rather like the rapid, re, you know, um, a review in rapid time. Um, uh, it has some similarities with the leader process in that it is uh, principally a paper based, uh, or if you see what a, a record based review. Um, um, Haringey have pioneered that, and I know a number of other. Um, uh, local authority areas are um, are beginning to roll it out also. And again, there is a pathway from um, what Haringey call fatality reviews uh, into safeguarding adult reviews um, as a referral pathway. Um, and indeed, I'm currently doing a SAR um, uh, for Haringey that was actually triggered um, uh, by uh, the outcome of two fatality reviews, two deaths of homeless people.
OK, that, that's in, that's interesting. Um, so are there any other questions from from the floor or I can't see anything else in the um, in the comments box. OK. In that case, I, I guess we can we can um, we can wind up there and it leaves me to to thank you very much for coming and doing this presentation this afternoon. I think it's certainly um, given us a lot of food for thought and um, a lot to think about in terms of what we how we take forward the report, both at uh, a local level within our own SABs, but also at a at a regional level as well. Um, so 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 thank you for that. It's been really helpful. Thank you to Howard for um, for handling the technology this afternoon. Um, it's certainly made my life easier as a chair, only having to worry about questions and and comments rather than having to worry about where the technology is going. So so thank you, Howard, for that. Um, but otherwise, thank you to all to to everybody else for your contributions and. Um, I hope it's been useful for everybody. So do I. Good to be with you all. And thank you for the time.